Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Goedemiddag. We're going to give a demo about flying the uh, fly-by-wire HV20 plane on the VETSIM network, show you how the ATC works, the air traffic control, show a little bit about how the plane works. And our demo will be from uh, Maastricht Beek Airport. Now we're going to fly to uh, Schiphol, Amsterdam. So, Valentin, can you tell us a little bit about the plane that we're flying today? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much to the VATSIM team for giving us the opportunity to present our plane, the A321X and the A320 NEO simulation here. And uh, so as you can see here, the pilots uh, and his co-pilot are just setting up the aircraft as any uh, A320 NEO pilot would do uh, in real life. They're uh, getting all the lights set up in the aircraft and shortly they're going to start uh, inputting their route into the flight computer so they can uh, safely navigate to uh, Rotterdam. Schiphol, Amsterdam. Schiphol, I'm sorry, yeah. All right, so as you can see, the pilots, uh, the pilots here in question behind me, they're still uh, setting up the plane. Uh, so we'll be doing a full flight on VATSIM. Now, for the people who don't know what VATSIM is, VATSIM is a uh, online uh, air traffic simulation network where people from all over the world provide live ATC to pilots from all over the world. So wherever you are, you might be able to get some real air traffic control with all the real world procedures. You'll be talking to controllers on the ground, giving taxi instructions. You'll be talking to controllers in the air, giving instructions on how you're gonna approach the airport and land your plane. And uh, of course, your plane has been fully integrated with, uh, with a lot of VATSIM features as well. Yes, exactly. So um, when you fly on VATSIM, there's often, uh, obviously, just like in real life, a, a wide range of instructions that uh, you'll be told to do. And um, it's important that as a pilot, you, you know your aircraft very well and uh, that the aircraft behaves as you would expect it, especially um, if you try to you know, simulate real world procedures. And so there's a lot of cool features that we have, we have implemented based on, on feedback that we have received from pilots and on VATSIM and, and real life, obviously. Um, and so you can see here, actually, they're using the uh, integrated tablet, the electronic flight bag. Um, and you can see on this list here, it's a list of all the available uh, radio frequencies in the area. So you can see uh, the Maastricht uh, ATIS, the information service. Um, and you can see a bunch of other frequencies like uh, the center controller here. This is a, a German approach controller. and. It, as you know, uh, the VATSIM network is divided into different sort of control sectors. And uh, through the EFB and the uh, A321X, you have the ability to uh, quickly switch frequencies uh, if you have to. Since, uh, uh, of course, in the real plane, you would have uh, two pilots doing this, and two, one working the radios and one working uh, the plane and controlling the plane. But uh, as a single pilot, it's useful to just have a quick list of all of the available frequencies uh, very nearby. It's a very convenient feature. Yeah, so I see they are currently setting up the uh, the flight plan for the for the flight today. You you guys completely uh, simulated the, uh, the the autopilot as well, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, the, the aircraft started off as a as a modification of a uh, default A320 simulation in Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, but we noticed over time that there were a lot of flaws in the autopilot logic. So uh, when the pilot gave an input to, to fly in a certain direction, the, the plane might not do it, or uh, certain instructions were not followed as, as they should be. And so uh, we took it into our own hands to, to basically tear it all out and, and rewrite it completely. And I think it's been, it's been a very large amount of work, but I, over time it's gotten really good and really reliable, which is what's very important. Would you say it's as real as it gets? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm not a pilot personally, of course, so I, I can't uh, say anything to that. But I, I certainly use it for VATSIM a lot, and we have a lot of real-life uh, pilots giving us feedback, as I've mentioned, and uh, they say that it's, it's it's reliable and they can use it, and yeah, very, yeah. it's very helpful. Yeah, because just an important thing to note, if you are not familiar with VATSIM, the, the goal of the network to is to simulate uh, air traffic control and aviation as real as possible, as real as it gets. So it's very important for the network that we have developers like Fly-by-Wire that create planes that are actually uh, simulated to that high level of precision compared to the real world planes so they can actually uh, fly the way they should be flying. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a, 
I don't know if anyone that's ever been on VATSIM and gotten into a, a stressful situation, the last thing you want to be worrying about is that uh, the, the aircraft is not doing what you'd expect and sort of debugging that at hand. Um, and, and so that's, that's really important and a, a really big step, I think, for me personally. We're just wrapping up some paperwork up front so here. what are we hearing right now? Because this is the plane, right? Yeah, so uh, this is a simulated uh, cabin announcement, as a uh, captain would say, on the real aircraft, making, making uh, 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 giving a message to all of the passengers. We appreciate your business having you aboard this flight. If there's anything we do to make your flight any more enjoyable, please don't hesitate to ask. Welcome aboard. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there is um, another feature of the integrated electronic flight bag is uh, the ability to run through checklists just like this. And uh, these checklists have been vetted really carefully uh, uh, from real life. And so they try to mimic the real thing as well, of course, uh, because to operate a plane you know, like you would in a similar manner, you want uh, that the checklists also resemble this, mm -hmm. this sort of bit. And you guys have also chart integration by the looks of it? Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is a nice integration with Navigraph charts. Uh, they provide uh, charts for, for flight simulation. and. Uh, it's an important thing when, when you fly on VATSIM to sort of know your way around the aircraft and it's crucial to, to understand the uh, instructions that the VATSIM controllers give when they tell you to go a certain direction on, on the airport, you want to know where that direction is and so the charts are incredibly helpful to have directly in the, the aircraft. Yeah, like we always say, it's, uh, preparation is, uh, is, uh, yeah. is half of work. Um, I think for VATSIM, it's probably even more than 50% uh, of, of your flight is going to be the preparation. If you're well prepared, you know what to expect, you know what the controllers are going to tell you. Just get a pen and paper, write it down real quick, and uh, and you should be able to, uh, you know, be on your flight, be on your way. Yeah, so um, I, I hear my uh, left ear, they're just going through the flight preparations, as you've mentioned, and they're doing a, a quick briefing of what they're going to be expecting for the um, a it, approach. It, it looks like they're actually going into Rotterdam, not into uh, Schiphol. <laughs> oh, yes, <Yeah. laughs> of course. So uh, let's assume they've had a quick diversion because Schiphol is, is, is busy with... Uh, uh, accepting uh, viewers from Flight Sim Weekend. So we're going to Rotterdam, less traffic, very good. Um, and so actually they're now programming in the route into the uh, the MCDU, as we call it. This is the flight computer. And uh, yeah, it's all part of the preparation. They're checking all of the, the waypoints very carefully to ensure that the aircraft navigates uh, along the airways that uh, have been filed on their flight plan, which is given to uh, all of the VATSIM controllers. And so they, they know where to guide the aircraft. And all of the VATSIM controllers are sure that the aircraft is indeed going to Rotterdam and not Schiphol, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So in a second, we'll be uh, contacting the uh, controller currently covering uh, uh, Maastricht Beek Airport. I, I'm not sure which controller is online. So the way VATSIM works is that we have uh, we have local controllers who do the local tower of, for example, Maastricht or Rotterdam or Schiphol. But they are not online because we're all volunteers. We all do it for fun. So if they are not online, then the controller covering the airspace above the airport will also cover the airport itself. So they will provide clearances. They will provide taxi instructions. They will provide a takeoff clearance. So I'm not sure who's online right now but we'll be probably be talking to either uh, Bake Tower, and if they're not online, it's probably going to be Approach, or even Amsterdam Radar, who are the highest authority in the Dutch airspace. And we're still looking at the uh, approach chart for Rotterdam, preparing the flight. So one of the crucial things for this flight is that it's a very short flight, which means that the preparation for both the departure and the approach have to happen uh, pretty early on, in this case even on the ground. For a longer flight, you would probably do the preparation for the approach uh, en route, but our uh, time en route is going to be uh, really short because we only have an hour here. <laughs> so what are they currently doing? I'm uh, seeing the uh, flight uh, computer. Yeah, so what they're doing is that they've uh, looked at the chart and see, uh, seen what uh, waypoints were on there, and they're just entering that into into the flight control computer there. Um, what you can see it's, uh, at the bottom of the screen, and I can... Oh, sorry. Uh, this is the Rotterdam Airport. The ICAO code is Echo Hotel Romeo Delta, and uh, they're going to runway 24. Um, what they've also set up is they're setting up the aircraft for an uh, instrument landing system, so an ILS, uh, because I, I hear the weather at Rotterdam might be a, a bit cloudy, and so the visibility might not be good enough for a visual approach, and so they're using uh, the instrument landing system to rely on the aircraft's navigation system to guide them down to the uh, runway safely. It's also... Um, Oh, sorry. 
Uh, sorry about that. All right, so uh, they're setting up the instrument landing system, as I was saying. And, uh, okay, so maybe moving on to the next point. This is uh, another point that is crucial for the preparation of the aircraft. Uh, they're now setting uh, all the performance figures uh, for the takeoff. So what you can see, uh, what you were able to see at the top left of the screen are uh, the characteristic speeds of V1, VR, and V2. These are uh, decision speed, rotation speeds, and, and, and safe climb away speed. So uh, these essentially are going to be represented to the pilot on the left-hand side of the screen directly in front of them. And they will tell the pilots when uh, to actually pull back on the stick and to uh, ensure a safe uh, liftoff of the aircraft when they're taking off. Um, there's also the, the V1 speed, which is the decision speed, and what it means is uh, if there is a, any problem during the takeoff roll at, at very high speeds, then the pilot needs to be aware that you know the braking distance might not be enough in, in order to abort the takeoff. And so at this speed, is it the, the speed where you say, okay, I'm going, I'm deciding that I'm continuing the takeoff roll, and I'm departing from the aircraft. And if I have an engine failure, uh, this is a speed where it is safe enough to climb away and return to the aircraft. Maybe this is also interesting. So they're currently actually connecting to VATSIM. They have filed a fly plan, Rotterdam, uh, sorry, bake to Rotterdam. They have uh, selected their own call sign. It's probably going to be something like uh, what? What's the problem, guys? Uh, I think it's fly by wire three two November yeah. X ray. So uh, that's a. Uh, it seems to be yeah. very busy. Oh, here we go. Now we're connecting. Here we go. So on the left side of the screen, you can actually see. Uh, look at that. We can. Uh, we already can hear the uh, the controller on the radio. So we're tuned into one two five decimal seven five, which you can see in the top left. That's actually Amsterdam radar. So we'll be talking to Amsterdam radar uh, for the first part. Hey, of the five, hello, clearance to Salzburg, Felni, four kilo departure, runway two one, climb level six zero, squawk three one seven three. Sounds like a departure from Eindhoven. Two one seven three, runway This is not right. Is it? Are we uh, tuned to bait now? Repair correct. Transatia 745, right heading 150, clear to ILS, runway 180. Oh, that's still, uh, that's still Amsterdam. All right, so uh, I assume our guys uh, will be uh, asking for clearance in a moment. Jenny, please tell me, please tell me, please tell me, please Seven to six, level it's very interesting to me to hear the uh, ATC uh, chat in the background with the pilots because uh, I, I sometimes listen in on, on real ATC um, and it sounds just like it is. It, it gives a feeling of you're part of the network and I think this is what I really enjoy about yeah. VATSIM. If, if, you, if you're new to VATSIM, I would always recommend to just listen in for a while, get, a, get used to what they're saying, try to understand what they're saying before you start talking to them yourself. It will help a lot with uh, getting used to the uh, the radio talk. Yeah, yeah. I, I think on VATSIM, it's it's sort of and in even real life ATC, there's a lot of uh, education that pilots get about correct phraseology, and so what this means is how you communicate uh, your intentions and what you're doing to to ATC effectively and how they talk to you, and so it's very useful to sort of have a, a repertoire of, of phrases that you're going to say because a lot of the flights they're going to have a similar sort of structure in, in what you're talking to ATC about. So in a moment we'll hear uh, them calling for their IFR clearance actually. So it's when uh, air traffic control clears them to actually uh, start this flight and fly to their destination airport. Oh, <laughs> it's not working. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like we're having some technical difficulties for a second. Stand by. <laughs> not unusual to have in a plane. Uh. Is there something you maybe can tell us about the development of the plane that, you know, some, some things you guys struggle with or maybe some special things? Yeah, so um, it's it's obviously, it's a really huge undertaking and I, I think I didn't realize this at first maybe, but it is there's a lot of involved in, invo in uh, developing an aircraft like uh, an A320neo because there's a, a huge number of systems and uh, there's a, a lot of things like the flight control computers that uh, we're Radio trying to check. imitate as closely as possible, uh, just like it is in the real plane. But then there's also the physical aspects of, uh, say, hydraulic systems or electrical systems, which actually should be modeled physically. So it's something that uh, works a bit differently yeah, in real life. So we, we obviously don't have uh, to set up the hardware of wires 
firing and hooking up flight controls. Let me just pause there because we're going to hear ATC talk to West clearance to what damage filed Alpha on board. All right. Here we go. That was the clearance. That was a. Fire fire three to the Remax A. Alpha correct. Clear to Rotterdam. Oscars to Bravo departure. Runway two one. Initial climb. Flight level six zero. Squawk seven zero two one. Flight level three to November X-ray clear to Rotterdam MS filed via the Oscar Stuba for departure runway 21. Initial climb flight level 60, squawk 7021. All right. Flight level three to November X-ray, read back correct, report fully ready. So that was our clearance. So we uh, we got a, a, a SIT, which is a SIT standard instrument departure. That's basically the route we're going to fly from the airport, uh, from the runway to the to the route that we, we want to fly. It's basically. Um, your own ramp, your oprit naar de snelweg, uh, your own ramp to the to the highway in the sky. Um, we also got the initial climb, so the initial altitude that we're going to climb to after departure. Uh, once we are airborne, we're going to climb to that altitude, and then ATC is going to provide us with further instructions to climb to our cruise level. This is usually done to uh, you know manage tra traffic a little bit. And the other thing we got is a squawk code. It's a four-letter, uh, four-number code actually. Uh, that radar uses to identify the plane. So we get a number assigned, and then the guys in the tower, they know uh, that is that plane with that flight plan uh, attached to it, because it belongs to that number. So they're currently going to be filling out the data they just got from uh, from, a pro uh, from the controller. And then once they got it all filled out, they're going to request uh, clearance for a pushback, and then they're going to taxi the runway, and they're going to depart. So we're going to depart runway 21, I believe. I do believe so. Yeah. I, th I think that's what I heard in the briefing. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be departing towards the south, right? Heading uh, 210, so that's south, southwest. And we'll probably be making a. I'm not sure if it's a left or a right turn. I don't know the departure by heart. But we'll be turning north, obviously, because we're going to go to Rotterdam. Yeah, so maybe uh, what you can see here is that they, they've started the APU. It's an auxiliary power unit that the aircraft possesses. And you can think of this as a, a sort of a small engine. And this is actually going to be used to provide bleed air, to provide high pressure air uh, into the engines and sort of make them spin up until uh, they can inject fuel and, and sustain themselves. Yeah, because the, the, these engines are so powerful, they need a separate engine to start the engines. Yeah, that's that's, that's yeah. really what it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the APU can also provide the power to the aircraft, and so it's it's a common thing to find on, on jet aircraft. Yeah, so as you see, we uh, just completed another checklist there. A lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> Not unusual on and an that's airfield just, like this. And that is just the APU, actually, because the engines, as you can see behind us, the engines haven't even started yet. That was just yeah. the uh, just the APU engine, which is in the back of the plane, actually, right? In the yeah, tail. Yeah, that's three, it, two, November yeah. X-ray, you can push the start. Flyer wire, T2, November X-ray, information alpha current. Take QNH, 1010, pushback and start up approved. All right, Alpha so... 1010, start up approved. Uh, from the wire, 3 2 November X-ray. So we've been approved for a push and start. So we can start the engines, we can push back the plane onto the taxiway, and then we can start taxiing out. We got the local uh, air pressure, which is important for uh, for knowing our altitude, which is kind of crucial for an airplane. And uh, let's see, so they're now currently starting the engines, still checking the, uh, the EFB. Can you tell something about the EFB? Because this is something that I'm not super familiar with. Yeah, of course. So uh, the EFB, the electronic flight bag, is the uh, tablet that you see on the left. And it's something that you will actually find on a, a modern flight deck, even if you go for a cockpit visit, maybe on your flight here. Um, and it has a special function, I think, in the simulator in that it, it does a lot of, it helps the pilot do a lot of these things that maybe will be done differently in real life. So a good example is here uh, the pushback uh, of the plane that is organized through the EFB here, because of course uh, there's no way you, you would interact with a, a ramp agent or something like this in, in, uh, in a simulator. And so the EFB helps coordinate a lot of these things. But there's also uh, things you'd find on a real life EFB, such as the checklists, for example, uh, which really uh, are a, a huge help to the pilots who, because it reduces a huge amount of paperwork and all of the uh, paper charts that you saw. So uh, the route descriptions are, are also all uh, available on the EFB. So, so, so you, could, you could say it's sort of a replacement for your, uh, your co-pilot a little bit? That's it, yeah, exactly. So uh, you also saw the uh, available frequencies earlier, and that's really helpful to quickly switch over to the correct frequency that you get uh, assigned. Do you guys actually support shared cockpit? Uh, we do, actually, yes. Uh, I personally have never used it to be uh, honest, but yeah, we do actually uh, 
uh, support shared cockpit flying and uh, I've heard of a couple of people come up to our, our fly-by-wire booth here and say that they really enjoy doing fl shared cockpit flights and uh, I think it's a really great tool uh, especially if you know you have some a real-life pilot friend maybe that can help you introduce uh, help introduce you to the Airbus cockpit yeah so VATSIM also supports sh uh, supports shared cockpit flying so if you want to fly with the two of you on the network that is absolutely possible with this plane all right, looks like we completed the pushback, and that means the next step is to taxi out to the runway. Now we'll be departing from runway 21, and I think we'll be fa we are currently facing, yeah, we're facing north, so we'll just taxi that way, and then we'll, uh, we'll go right onto the, onto the runway. Yeah, so they're just running through the uh, final preparations for the, uh, after the engine start and for the takeoff, so... Uh, obviously, uh, a bit of a technical detail after the engines are started, uh, the aircraft is actually supplied with hydraulic pressure uh, from the engine-driven pumps of the engine, and so it's actually only possible after engine start to set the correct flap setting, for example, and uh, extend the flaps for takeoff and uh, arm the speed brakes and, and things like that. So there's just running through those final items, uh, which you can see here on the uh, what's called the after start uh, checklist, which is what you run after you've started both of the aircraft's engines. Right, so after start check, the list is complete. So we're now on to the taxi checklist. So we'll probably ask for taxi clearance. Fly by wire 3 to November X-ray, request taxi. Fly by wire 3 to November X-ray, taxi holding point Whiskey 1, runway 2-1, cross Whiskey 2. Taxi holding point of Whiskey 1, runway 2 1, cross Whiskey 2, fly by 3 2 November X ray. Yeah, so that's just your standard taxi instruction. They uh, probably have the chart in front of them, so they uh, know exactly where they. Uh, they need to go. Now, obviously, Maastricht is not a very big airport. There's not a lot of taxiways. So uh, it shouldn't be too difficult to get to the runway. Now, there's obviously some airports like Schiphol that are very complicated. And in that case, it's absolutely crucial, especially on Vatsum, but in any case, to make sure that you have a chart in front of you, that you know where you're going. And if you call ATC for instructions, that you maybe write them down. And don't worry if you didn't hear it correctly the first time. Just ask again. Say again, please. And they will be happy to... Uh, repeat it for you. Yeah, so the aircraft is uh, moving on its under its own power now and getting uh, ready to taxi to the runway. Uh, and so they've just uh, completed their taxi checklist, which includes setting all the lights. And uh, yeah, we'll just look away for a moment there. <laughs> uh, luckily, we're in the plane and not the car, so that's all good. Um, but yeah. Uh, it's all it's part of aviation to stay ahead of the aircraft in this case and so you've seen that the pilots already ran uh, their taxi checklist before they started the taxi out but while they were waiting for uh, ATC to be free and so they're just making their taxi a bit easier and while they're taxiing they can now already uh, prepare for takeoff so uh, when they're clear they're just ready to go and not in the way of anyone yeah so in case anyone's interested in this plane as far as I know this plane is entirely free right it is indeed yeah so it was developed by a group of how many people? Bye bye bye. Uh, three two oh. November X Are you ready for departure? There we go. Stand by three two November X Right. So they're not ready to go yet. So it sounds like they're still doing some uh, pre-departure uh, checklist. Obviously, they need to set the flaps correctly. They need to make sure that uh, you know they have, they have all the checklists completed. Yeah, so uh, many, maybe I can say a little something about our team. So uh, uh, as he mentioned, we're a, a team of volunteer contributors and uh, people that want to improve this plane as much as possible and want it to get into a state where it's a uh, fly build just like... Fly by wire 32 November X-ray, runway 21, cleared for takeoff, the winter take of 190 degrees, 11 knots. Cleared for takeoff, runway 21, fly by wire 32 November X-ray. Alright, so that's our takeoff clearance, so it will now be uh, departing and uh, now a lot of things will happen at once, obviously we'll uh, start our roll and then once we have reached the uh, V1 speed, there's no turning back. We need to commit to takeoff. Then once we reach the VR or V rotate speed, we rotate the plane up. We'll take off, and then once we are uh, climbing out, uh, we'll be um, retracting the gear, and uh, we'll be on our way flying the departure route. And then we'll probably be receiving further instructions from ATC pretty soon. 
Yeah, so uh, I think this is always a very exciting moment, uh, even if you just fly on Vatsim, but receiving that takeoff clearance is, is, is a great part because, you know, it, it takes quite a bit of uh, preparation to get the aircraft ready, but then once you're ready and everything is set up and you get the takeoff clearance, it's the feeling of getting to go. I mean, it's the same as a passenger going on holiday is always very exciting. I would say that are the two most fun things of the flight, right? The departure and then the landing, of course, afterwards. That's it, yeah. There we go, we hear the engines roaring up. Yeah, now we should be departing, uh, we should be taking off pretty quickly because the plane is probably quite empty. We don't have a lot of fuel on board because it's a short flight. So uh, let's see how much of the runway we need. It's uh, quite a long runway, uh, Maastricht. They uh, receive a lot of big airplanes with cargo. Oh, here we go. That was quick. All right, let's see positive rate gear up. Yeah, that's the gear. You can hear it in the background. Absolutely beautiful. It's a nice day, good weather. Yeah. All the weather in Vatsim uh, is, is live. This is Microsoft Flight Simulator with live weather. So this is currently approximately the real situation over in uh, in Limburg. Yep. And I will be receiving a call from ATC soon that uh, they see that we are airborne and uh, they have us identified on their radar. You can see the Maas River there in the background. Or in the foreground, actually. Distance. So what you just saw there is that the pilot flew the departure by hand, so the autopilot was not engaged, but as of this moment he's engaged the autopilot because this is, again, quite a, a, a critical phase of flight and uh, the workload is pretty high, especially as a single pilot. You want to get uh, your flaps retracted, you want to set the correct thrust setting for the climb, and probably then at the worst moment ATC is going to come in and call you and give you an instruction, so it's very useful to engage the autopilot at this point. And, uh, get your hands free, so to speak, to, to take care of the other stuff. Yeah, they'll keep you busy, so it's definitely recommended that before you start flying on the path, seem that you are kind of familiar with... Wired, E2 November XJ, identified, climb flight level 100, proceed direct to Oskos. Alright, so we got an instruction Oskos to continue Oskos our climb. Level 100, level oh, sorry. We got an instruction to continue our climb, so we got an initial climb of 6 uh, we're now climbing to fly level 100, and we got a direct to one of the waypoints in our... Uh, in our flight plan, so we got a little shortcut there. Um, this is, this happens a lot, actually. If there's no other traffic in the area that we need to, uh, you know, f uh, be worried about, they can usually give you a little shortcut for your uh, for your flight there. Now our cruise today will not be very long. Obviously, uh, Rotterdam is pretty close, so uh, our pilots will probably be uh, quite busy for a while. This is a nice view. Lovely. So you guys have also added a lot of uh, nice outside and inside views to the plane, right? Yeah, and what, what I'm especially impressed with is obviously uh, the view, but also the sound uh, scape that's really nice. You know, this this is indeed what you'd be hearing as a passenger, especially sitting right next to that aircraft. It's that low right, humming right, bass. Right, it's really cool. Amsterdam radar on 125.750, over by. 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 All right, so they got a handoff from uh, Maastricht uh, or Bay to Amsterdam radar. So now we'll be contacting the control that's covering all of the Netherlands in the uh, in the upper airspace. And uh, as you'll know, and as you'll notice, it's going to be a lot more. Uh, it's going to be a lot busier on frequency. You're going to hear a lot of uh, chatter uh, with other planes that are currently actually flying on VATSIM on the network and also doing flights from wherever to wherever and passing through the, uh, the Dutch airspace. So at this point, it's kind of crucial that you keep an eye near out for your call sign in case they uh, they want to tell you something. What I'm really impressed with uh, with VATSIM especially is the ability to fly with uh, uh, airplane. Runway 3 to November XV, Amsterdam, good morning, expect runway 2 4. Incat 2 Romeo, arrival, expect runway 2 4, runway 3 to November XV. Alright, so our pilot, our pilot just checked in with Amsterdam radar, so he told them hello, I'm hearing your frequency, and he immediately got instructions from uh, Amsterdam uh, about his approach into Rotterdam, so we can now immediately start our uh, preparation for our landing. Um, which is, again, kind of crucial because we're already so close. Southland 260, speed break, runway 1. 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 Southland 260, speed break, runway 1
Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it tends to happen with these uh, sort of top-down controls where you have a big center also controlling regional airports and uh, coordinating the approach and it's a uh, very impressive feat for sure. Mm -hmm. 776, turn left heading 210, cleared ILS, runway 1 So we've already reached our cruise, at least our uh, current cruise. Uh, I don't know if we wanted to go any higher than uh, flight level 100. As you can see on the, uh, on the left screen there. Yeah, right around there. We're flying at about, I would say, 290 knots. Yep. Yeah, we're currently northbound. Then we'll go, uh, we'll turn left in a second. We'll go right over Eindhoven, by the looks of it. And then we'll be, uh, yeah, we'll go right over Eindhoven. That's the waypoint there. And then we'll continue on in a straight line to Rotterdam. And we'll be landing on uh, runway 24 because the wind has been blowing from the southeast today, as it has been yesterday as well. So we'll always be landing and departing with. Uh, with a headwind. Yes. So what you uh, briefly saw there on the flight com com computer again is uh, the setup for the performance data for the arrival. So as, as they set up the uh, performance figures and the speeds for the departure, they're now setting up, uh, for example, the air pressure, the QNH uh, 1007 uh, at their airfield, and this helps the aircraft set up for the approach and uh, give the pilots the correct guidance for uh, the approach speed to make a, a safe approach. Yeah. So they were just checking the weather there. They were checking the uh, what's the situation. We got a little bit of rain by the looks of it. You can see the winds here, 190 at 13 knots. So we got a bit of wind from the south, southwest. We're looking, we're looking at the, uh, the the approach chart. We're looking at some approach data. These are the minimums. So if we're at 204 feet, we should be able to uh, we should be able to see the runway. So hopefully the clouds aren't too low today. Although that is really low. There we go. Yeah. So since they've set up for uh, an instrument landing system where the instruments can provide guidance to the runway, uh, the point at which the pilots need to see the runway is actually really close. So that's 200 feet, about 60 meters only above the runway, and until that point they can be completely engulfed in fog essentially. Yeah. So, so basically. We could be flying without looking outside of the windows. Exactly, yeah. So a lot of things are happening at once. It might be a little bit confusing uh, <laughs> to, to people that are not very familiar with this plane, uh, but it's all things that need to happen uh, for this landing to, uh, to be successful. Exactly, yeah. And a lot of what's being done here, for example, this is uh, the performance calculation for the landing distance, so they're just making sure again that the, la the runway they're landing on in the current conditions, so if there, it might be wet or uh, there might be uh, some adverse winds coming uh, down the runway, they're just making sure that the aircraft is going to be able to uh, stop in time. Because that's, that's kind of important, right? You yeah. don't want to <laughs> slip off the end. Yeah, of course. <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is also something that you'd find in a, in a real uh, electronic flight bag and a real tablet. This is something that the pilots would do during their cruises to ensure that uh, all of the data is correctly entered and the runway is, is, is ready for their landing. So they're already checking out the, tax, the taxi charts actually for other lands. So this is good preparation as well. Like know what what you're expecting once you're landed as well. Know where you need to vacate on which side, where you're going to be taxiing, all that good stuff. In this case, we'll be landing runway uh, 24 at Rotterdam. So the apron is actually at the far end of the runway. So we'll be vacating, making a left turn, and we'll be straight at our parking spot. Pretty much. Seabird 91 Papa Echo, how far are we off? So what you can see here is the uh, landing distance calculation. So you saw that uh, with a auto brake, uh, the auto brake system set to the medium setting, they're going to be able to stop in about uh, 1,500 meters, whereas the uh, low auto brakes uh, setting would actually not be enough. So that they're going to have to use medium auto brakes or just control the braking system manually. It's also something that is. Uh, modeled obviously in the plane uh, to have the aircraft automatically apply brakes on touchdown and, and make a smooth deceleration for the passengers. So the runway at Rotterdam is not extremely long, it's uh, just over two kilometers compared to like the runways at uh, Schiphol which are like four, so uh, there's a little, little less room for error there, so you need a little bit more braking power. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Meanwhile you can still hear uh, Amsterdam radar busy giving clearances in the background. This is also one of the crucial things of FATSIM, you need to be able to, to filter out that chatter in the background while you're busy working on uh, a lot of stuff you get used to it but it's a, it's a skill that you need to you need to learn you just need to be focused on hearing your own call sign basically once the, once your own call sign comes on radio it's uh, it's your job to answer
Amsterdam, right, so it looks like they've set up uh, most of the uh, data in the flight computer for the approach, and so they're pretty much ready. They know what the uh, airfield looks like, so now it's just a matter of uh, waiting on descent clearance from ATC, essentially. You can see the top of descent where the aircraft wants uh, uh, the aircraft to go down and, and start the approach in order to make a, a sort of most, the most efficient descent that they can. Yeah, so the, the aircraft is pretty smart, really. Yeah, it's it's something that uh, is really useful in providing guidance to to the pilots because it's while well, they obviously still check that the automatics are doing what they're supposed to and they're running their own calculation in their head, it, it's something that can really take a lot of workload off and provide situational awareness as well when, when there's a lot of things going on. Yeah, it's trying to help the pilots as much. As can. That's it. Yeah. So as you can see, we just. Uh, entered the clouds here so it's going to be interesting if we're going to see the uh, at what time we'll be seeing the runway actually yeah <laughs> yeah maybe i can uh, i can brief you for a, a quick technical detail so while they're going to be approaching the runway and in the last stages of the approach you're going to hear a call out that the aircraft says uh, 100 above and minimums and this is the aircraft announcing that they've reached the crucial height where they need to see the runway uh, in order to continue the approach. If they do not see the runway at this point, they have to execute a go-around procedure and be guided back around for another approach or possibly a diversion if the weather is not good enough at the airport. Mm -hmm. And our VETSIM controls are, in, are entirely trained for that as well. So if you, uh, if you need to make a go-around, if you make a mistake, they can help you. To, to make that go around, try the approach again, and even if it happens another time, that's no problem. Yeah. It's all part of the, uh, the real world procedures as well, and we completely uh, are, uh, are aware of that. Also something that's very exciting, or was exciting for me, my first go around on VATSIM. <laughs> there's a lot of things happening, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. very cool. Oh, look at that view. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. So I believe we're currently pretty much going in a straight line to Rotterdam. So uh, let's have a look there. Okay, so if you if you look on the uh, on the map there, so you'll see we'll make a right turn once we get pretty close, and then we'll make two left turns to line up with the uh, with the with the runway. And that's going to be about another 30 miles. So we'll be there in. Uh, in just a few minutes. Flight level 240, Lufthansa 1. Flight level 320, November X ray, we set to flight level 45. Expect the ILS approach number 24. We set to flight level 45, expect the ILS number 24, flight level 320, November X ray. Alright, flight level 45, and we're going to expect the ILS approach for, uh, runway, uh, for the runway. So pretty much as we already planned for, as you, as we, you maybe have seen, they, they were already looking at the ILS approach, and that was just confirmed by the controller, which is always nice, that your preparation matches, your expectations matches with what the controller uh, wants you to do, uh, which again will make your life a lot more easy. Um, so we'll start at the send here. And uh, usually, once we uh, we start our approach, we're going to be at about 2,000 feet, uh, at least here in the Netherlands. Usually, so uh, we'll get another descent instruction probably uh, in, uh, in another uh, mile 20, I think. If I could just uh, point out another technical detail, what you can see here on the, on the uh, map of the aircraft is actually. If I see it correctly, it's another airplane that the aircraft has identified through their transponder and uh, it's really important for situational awareness. Also, the pilots now know that there's other aircraft going to uh, Rotterdam and things might get more busy and the uh, controller might uh, give the correct uh, sort of separation instructions and specific speeds to fly in order to ensure uh, separation between the aircraft. So they just vanished? There were actually two planes there, it looked like. But they just vanished. I think they were actually small, small planes. By the, look, by the looks of it. Maybe, yeah. Maybe an interesting detail as well, as you can hear in the background, we uh, have people of all ages on VATSIM. <laughs> you can start off a VATSIM as, as young as uh, 13 years old, and uh, we also have guys that are, um, well, way past retirement, so to speak, and you're all more than welcome. We uh, are, uh, you know, we are a very, uh, we, we like to have everyone uh, within VATSIM. You can, you can learn at any age, we believe, and uh, we love to help you. There's a lot of resources on our... Uh, on our platforms to to help you with yeah, becoming a pilot of AdSim, but also if you're interested in sitting on the other side and 
extracting planes. Of course, you can also become a controller if you're interested in uh, having a chat with us later on. We're in the back uh, next to uh, Fly by Wire, actually, so you can visit us at FATSIM and uh, you know, learn more about how you can actually become a controller. So it's still pretty cloudy. I, uh, I'm really curious uh, how, uh, how the weather is going to be at uh, yeah. all final. So we're still flying on autopilot, but what will happen is that we'll fly autopilot all the way down to the runway, and then once we get to about a thousand feet above, uh, usually about a thousand feet above, they'll probably switch off the autopilot to complete the landing. Um, by hand. You could, of course, do all this flying manually. Uh, I don't think the Airbus is really made for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think what, from what I've heard, it, it varies between um, Airbus operators, between uh, sort of what is advised in, in terms of operating the aircraft and uh, whether the use of the autopilot is, is encouraged or, I mean, in these types of situations, it, it, it's sort of a pilot's discretion to make sure, okay, I, I want to fly the aircraft and I sort of, I'm a pilot, I get paid to fly the aircraft. But also, uh, all right, so we just got an instruction from the Amsterdam uh, radar controller to contact Schiphol Approach. Now, you might be thinking, why are we going to contact Schiphol Approach? Because we are actually going to fly into Rotterdam. But Rotterdam is so close to uh, Schiphol that Rotterdam is... Fly by wire, 3-2 November X-ray, hello, it'll be vectors for the ILS, runway 24. information, uh, I don't think there is an A in Rotterdam at the moment, but he said 3,000 feet, QNH at Rotterdam, 1006. All right, so we just got a... Uh, 3,000 feet, QNH, 1006, and vectors for the ILS, number 24, fly by wire, 3-2 November x Yeah, so we just got some information from the... Fly by wire, 3-2 November X-ray, turn right heading 0 yeah, so we're getting vectors. We're getting vectors for the ILS runway uh, 24. That means that the approach controller is actually going to take us from the planned path, and they're going to give us heading instructions. So you're going to turn into a certain direction to line us up with the runway. This is not always. This is not always required, but it's usually easier to sequence traffic and uh, make sure that uh, there's no conflicts with other traffic that might be flying in this area. As I was saying before. Um, we are contacting Schiphol Approach because Rotterdam is so close to Schiphol that most of the uh, approach is actually performed by the Schiphol Approach controller because it's just easier instead of having separate uh, positions uh, for that. And also because on VATSIM we obviously don't have every position covered 24-7 because we're all volunteers and we all do it for fun. Yeah, so we have a lot of wind. <laughs> It's 41 knots on the tail. The good thing is that it looks like the wind is roughly pointing in the runway yep. direction. So yep. uh, hopefully for the pilots, the crosswind component yeah, so maybe will be fairly small. So the runway is on our left there. So we'll, we'll first be flying away a little bit from the airport, then we'll make two left turns and then we'll be perfectly lined up for the approach. Because, of course, we need a little bit of distance to descend that last bit. Maybe you can tell us something about the ILS, because I'm already seeing the... Yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the uh, instrument landing system uh, has been received by the aircraft. So you can see this uh, sort of magenta diamond showing up. And it's essentially the uh, beam coming from the ILS that tells you what altitude for the aircraft to fly it in order to be aligned with the runway. Uh, at this point, they're not sort of aligned with the runway yet, so this this is not valid for pilot use yet. I believe it it Fly looks the pretty much correct. Yeah, there we go. So we're going to go down to 2,000. Then we'll get two left turns. We'll be lining up. You'll see that magenta uh, diamond uh, at the bottom. It will be lined up right in the center. We're currently, uh, as you can see, we're currently Hello, right of the ILS. Yeah, so that I'm little magenta diamond will. Thing will be right in the middle on that yellow line. And then the diamond on the right side will be also right in that yellow line. And the plane will catch that. It's basically a radio signal from the ground beaming up. And we'll be catching that radio signal and following it down to the runway. And it's the controller's task right now to have us intercept that signal. <laughs> yeah. So let's hope he does a good job. So he's probably going to give us a left turn now in a second, probably heading 
two seven zero. Nine or one, Papa. That's my guess. Uh, maintain your present heading we'll and try to maintain it. your altitude. And it should be a thirty degree right angle, direction. and it's a the runway heading is two four zero. Uh, you can maintain a, a so let's see if that's uh, still very much in the clouds as of this moment, yeah. so we, this is going to be an interesting approach. So as a, as a pilot, you're really not looking at the window, you're really just looking at... My provider, 3-2 November X-ray, left heading 260. 6 Clear ILS approach, runway 24. That's also okay. Left heading 260, don't clear So you're really only looking at those those panels at the bottom, because what's on the... You know, you, <laughs> you're only seeing grey up there, and you're only waiting, basically, until you get down to about 300 feet, uh, you know, that you wanna you wanna see the runway, you wanna make sure it's actually there. Bye bye bye. Three two and a max eight. You are uh, taking you through the localizer. Could you the left turn heading two one zero to intercept? Okay, so. It sounds like we're going a little bit too fast because we overshot the localizer, so we're going to approach from the other side. Not sure what's going on, guys. <laughs> Maybe the approach controller was uh, was a bit busy. It happens. And they're a bit late with the instructions, but we can correct. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, things to coordinate uh, with all the different aircraft and making sure they're at the correct altitude and direction uh, to intercept the instrument landing system. So what you can see here at the top of the center screen is uh, the letters G and S and LOC. And these are the, the, the two components essentially of the ILS. So the GS is the glide slope, which guides the aircraft vertically, and the LOC, which is the localizer, which guides the aircraft uh, laterally. And these are these modes are blue at the moment, and they're going to become active when the aircraft is in the correct position. So let's have a look at the little diamond at the bottom lines up with our plane in a second. I don't see it coming any closer yet. So there we go, there we go. It's moving. Yeah, we there the localizer. Go. The aircraft has captured the localizer. And you'll see this uh, localizer diamond come into the center of the white, uh, the yellow bar here, uh, as was announced previously. And soon enough, you'll also see this glide slope diamond come down and intercept uh, with the aircraft's altitude. Yeah, so the little diamond at the bottom means we are lined up with the runway center line. And then the little diamond uh, on the right side will show us if we're at the correct altitude to make the approach. And we're still below yeah, the glide slope. Uh, so that means that uh, we're at a good place. Approach. We're still yeah, uh, waiting to get close to the runway. So the runway is about, what, about 10, right, 10 miles away. It's just showing up at the top of the uh, display there. That's the runway. Yes, and we're slowly approaching. And we still can't see the runway. Uh, exactly. yeah. <laughs> this is always a very exciting part of the flight. You can see the pilots now uh, decelerating the plane in order to make a, a smooth sort of descent on the glide slope and make sure the aircraft is, is ready to descend. Here we go. Here we go. So we're going to go to, Am uh, to Rotterdam Tower now, the local tower controller, and he's going to give us our landing clearance. Yeah, that sounds like tower. All right, so we are clear to land. As you can see, we're still waiting to capture the glide slope there. So the glide slope, we're still slightly below the glide slope. Once we capture that diamond, we will follow the signal down. The plane is already almost fully configured for landing, I believe. We're uh, lowering the flaps, we're going to be lowering the gear. You might be able to hear the, the noise in the background. And then we're just going to be praying that we see the runway uh, show <laughs> up in a little bit. <laughs> we'll probably see the lights first. And then once we see the lights uh, and we see the runway, uh, we, we can safely land. We're still on autopilot. Uh, in these weather conditions, it's usually advised that you uh, stay in autopilot a little bit longer. Uh, these planes are, I think these planes are actually fully capable of making an auto land as well. They are indeed, yes. Uh, the interesting thing about the auto land is it's something that's pretty done pretty rarely by uh, by Airbus operators and by aircraft operators in general. It's only done if the visibility is so bad that there is essentially no height at which point you'll see the runway and you can use the aircraft to, to land itself. 
but there's a lot of requirements uh, for the air crew and the runway uh, and the airport uh, to perform in Auto Land in order to not get any signal interruptions. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we started our descent, we're slowly descending, we're now at 1700 feet. Uh, as said earlier, we need to see the runway when we are at uh, 214 feet, which is about, what's that, 70 meters above the ground, I would say. So uh, let's hope we, uh, we do. It will be another, what's that, about five miles? Yeah. Yeah. We, already, we already have been cleared to land, so uh, we, we are fully, uh, fully ready. Just wait. You just uh, heard the gear coming down in the background. The door is open and the gear actually dropping out. So uh, that's always a good sign when the gear is down and you're trying to win. That's the sound of a real A320 gear coming down, I assume. It is indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Almost there. At this point, the pilots are only about uh, 1,100 feet, so about uh, uh, maybe three, 400 meters above the ground. But they're still very much looking inside and not uh, looking at the runway at all, uh, because the instruments are the only thing they can trust at this point, uh, because it's just great. Yeah, there's no runway inside yeah. yet, but just still time. Now, I don't remember seeing what the ceiling was in the weather report. <laughs> I don't remember either, but... Um, so the yeah. ceiling is basically where, the, where the, the lowest cloud coverage is, and if it's too low, then obviously it will be a bit troublesome to land. Uh, let's see, we're now at 700 feet, so five... Oh, there we go, there we go. That's approach light. Okay, so that's the runway, so now we're visual. So now we can safely land, well above minimums. About That's 300 feet. <laughs> you see... That's the autopilot yep. going off. So the pilot is now uh, fully flying with a stick. 500. So you can see the puppy lights on the left. So we are uh, two white, two red. That means we're right oh. on target. If it's more than one white, we're too high. Uh, sorry, more than three white, it's too high. If you see three reds, now we're a little low. 100 above. And the wind is coming from the northwest, so a bit from the uh, sorry, the southwest. So it's coming a bit from the left side, 200. front left. So you can see we're being pushed a bit to the right, minimum, a bit right of center line. But uh, our pilots are hopefully capable of correcting. One hundred. Here we go. One hundred. Let's see. Let's see if it's a smooth one like yesterday. <laughs> Fifty. Forty. Thirty. That's twenty 30 feet. Retard. Retard. So oh oh wow guys. So the retard call-out is not an insult, it's actually the, the plane telling the pilots to retard the throttles back. <laughs> and uh, they're now braking, I don't know if they're using the reverse thruster, yeah, they are using the reverse thruster, so the engines are actually firing uh, uh, backwards to uh, decelerate the plane uh, quickly. Of course, this runway, like I said earlier, is pretty short, so they can use that extra uh, reversing power to slow down the plane uh, before the end. All right, that's perfect. So they've uh, landed, slowed down to 30 knots, and now ATC will tell them uh, where they can go uh, taxi and park the aircraft once they have vacated. Yeah, so you might have heard a, a bit of a firmer touchdown, if I'm uh, allowed to say that, but uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's especially on a short runway like this, you want to make sure that you get the aircraft down on the ground and get braking going because um, it doesn't matter if you make a smooth touchdown in the middle of the runway, then you're not able to stop and go off the end. So yeah. definitely good, especially also in windy conditions. All right. That was our tax instruction. That is basically the last instruction you'll be getting on on Vatsen once you land, uh, unless there is any traffic uh, on the taxiways that you maybe be in conflict with at a later point, but this is a small airport, so we'll probably not be dealing with any other traffic. So I think that's it for the flight. Now, I'm curious, uh, are there any questions in the audience? Yeah, sir, over there. Which version of the fly-by-wire have we uh, been using here? Uh, this is the experimental version, I believe. Is that correct? This is correct, yeah. So this is the latest version? The experimental version. version. So there's essentially, if um, people are curious, there's three different versions that we run and maintain, uh, depending on sort of how, uh, what type of features you want to be getting. The experimental version typically has the latest features, but uh, there might be certain bots occurring, um, which are still being tested. 
Any other questions? Rotterdam Tower, a good morning. Scandavia 7-7, Quebec, on the Alice approach, runway 2-4. Yeah, so uh, I, I think sometimes there's in other aircraft there is automatic collapse by the by the aircraft. I think you're referring to that the aircraft says V1. Uh, so according to our references, this doesn't happen in, in sort of the short shorter haul aircraft uh, Airbus planes. Uh, I think the A350 and the A380 are actually have automatic callouts by uh, the plane for V1, and uh, but in the sort of short haul aircraft. Um, it's done by the pilot monitoring that calls out V1 and, and rotate. Uh. Yeah, because you guys work together with a lot of real-world A320 pilots, correct? Indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is incredibly helpful because uh, it's very hard as a developer to get access to a, a, a real plane, so you're kind of relying on, on, on them. It looks to like our pilots back. are not very familiar with Rotterdam because they taxied onto the wrong taxiway and all their stands <laughs> on our right are taken. Well, you can do, you can make a left turn, but that's not really allowed, guys. <laughs> Any other questions mm -hmm. from the audience? Yes, sir. When, when do you activate the approach phase? Yeah, so this is a it's a great question, and I don't think there's a clear answer, unfortunately. So, uh, basically, I, I think the official guidance by Airbus is about. 15 to 20 miles uh, out from the airport or where you expect to land, you'll want to activate the approach phase and uh, that'll allow you to, if you're not ready to decelerate to, to your uh, green dot or flap speed, <laughs> it's fine, they'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, if you're not ready to decelerate, you can just select the speed and then have it ready and then uh, go into managed speed and allow the aircraft to decelerate on its own. Yeah. It's about 15 to 20 miles from the airfield, I would say. but. It can depend depending on where you go and yeah. sort of what the route you'll ex you're expecting. Niels, do we have any questions over there? No, no questions. All right, all right. I think that's it. If there's no more questions from the audience, then I thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I believe, yeah. All right. So if you want to exit the, uh, the room, it's uh, on at the bottom on the left and the right side. And uh, make sure to visit our stand. Kom even langs met onze stand, nog achter in de uitzaal. Uh, of bij Fly by Wire. En uh, dan uh, helpen we jullie graag nog met het beantwoorden van jullie vragen. Dankjewel. Thank you.